Good morning and welcome to Ecclesia. We are delighted that you're with us, however that may be. Some of you are uh, watching right now on YouTube, um, on Zoom. Others are watching later this afternoon on YouTube. And a good number of you are right here in the room with us and we're just so glad that you're here. We always begin our service by speaking into our presence, those who are not with us, starting with our beloved sister congregation in Lava Ita, Cuba, Rios de Agua Viva. And they are meeting right now in their little, I guess it's, uh, I was gonna say brick, it's not brick, it's concrete. Uh, their little concrete church and um, they're, the blue walls and, and their wooden benches that are being eaten up by termites. And we really want to replace them with plastic ones, but can't figure out how to get them there. Um, and they're meeting right now, and Pastor Annabelle and Pastor Sila are speaking their sister church, Ecclesia, and Carolina de Norte. And they're speaking us into their presence, and we're speaking them into ours, and just like that, we are together and we are one. There are others who are not with us today, and we invite you now to speak their names into our presence. Dana and Coy. Now, I don't know for sure, they are out of town, Jay did check to see uh, what the, the, the Tennessee, the, the World Series of College Baseball, uh, because the University of Tennessee is involved in that event. So um, we don't know for certain they're there, but we don't know they're not there either. So Dane and Coy, absolutely. Who else? So we mentioned Caitlin and Caitlin already. Um, they are traveling on family um, for a family funeral. Stan and Kim. Stan and Kim are, in, Kim are in Havana. And there has been a lot of rain in Havana and some real destruction there. So we ask for your prayers for our brothers and sisters in Havana. So. Yes. Oh, wow. Well. Wow. Wonderful. Okay, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. We got it. We have a um, we have a heavy percentage of Dotsons present today. Anyway, um, we're so glad that you're here. Now, are y'all from the Methodist Church upstairs? Wonderful. Well, thanks for coming down and worshiping with us. We're glad you're here. That's all right. <laughs> well, that's all right. Uh, that's my husband's future right there. When I say I'm very old, that's why we're late. <laughs> I look forward to that day when I can say that that's why I'm late. Um, oh, wow. 62 years being members here that's so you may be a youngster among this crowd but uh because i know some of these folks have been members of oakley united methodist for a really long time what wherever you are and however you are with us today we're glad you're here um, for those who are not with us we always miss you um, if you're watching later on youtube know that you're in our hearts and prayers today and so now let us begin with our opening hymn. Please stand. Is this one in the hymnal? Yes. All right. So please stand as we sing our first hymn and we'll get the hymnals passed about. So it'll be page 12. Our opening hymn will be Come Christians Join to Sing. Page 12. Hallelujah, amen. Little with Lord and 
You may be seated. Thank you, Sage and Chris. Well, it is already that time, Cliff. Can you believe it? Yeah. Mm. And what time is that, you might ask? Time for the children's story. And today's story, I so wish that Bob Williams had come down because I remember when I first read this book, which was five or six, almost six years ago now, he laughed, we were meeting in the, um, in the realty office and he laughed through the whole thing. So I wish he'd come down today, he missed it. Um, Cause today's book is Hawaii for Wadney Wat. And it is written by, I'm looking at illustrator's name, Helen Lester and illustrated by Lynn Munsinger. Poor Wadney Watt. His real name was Rodney Rat, but he couldn't pronounce his R's. To make matters worse, he was a rodent, a rodent. Ah. Okay, this is fine. What's your name, Wadney? Asked the other rodents. Wadney Watt, whispered Wadney. What's another the name for bunny? They asked knowingly. Wabbit he mumbled. And how does a train travel? They winked at each other. A twain travels on twain twacks, Wadney replied miserably. All of this teasing day in and day out made Wadney the shyest rodent in his elementary school. His squeak could barely be heard in class. He gnawed lunch alone. And while the other rodents scurried and scooted about at recess, Wadney hid inside his jacket. Then one day, as the rodents were taking turns doing wheelies, a new rodent, a very large rodent, barged into the classroom and announced, my name is Camila Capybara. I'm bigger than any of you. I'm meaner than any of you. And I'm smarter than any of you. Then she added, so there. With that, she accidentally, on purpose, elbowed an ear, bumped two noses, stepped on three tails, and lay down on a desk. Fur prickled in fear throughout the classroom. She sure was bigger than any of them. She sure looked meaner than any of them. Was she smarter than any of them? What's two plus two? asked Miss Fuzzleworth. Four! shouted Camila Capaberry without even bothering to raise her paw. And furthermore, four plus four is eight, eight plus eight is 16, and 243 plus 125 is 368, so there. Later, when Ms. Fuzzleworth asked, what's the capital of, Camila interrupted, New York, Albany, population 295,594. And during science, in answer to the question, what part of a plant is below the ground? Camila Capybara danced on her desk and sang, root, root, rooty toot toot. Yep, thought all the other rodents. She's smarter than we are too. They all felt very, very uncomfortable. Every afternoon, just before the final research says, Miss Fuzzleworth drew a name to see who would be the leader of Simon Says. She scrunched her eyes closed and jiggled the hat. Who would it be? Miss Fuzzleworth's paw reached in and pulled out the name of Wadney Watt. The bell rang. There was a wild scurry for the door, and Camila Capybara was the first on the playground, having trampled the others in her path. To Wadney, she looked especially scary. What would she do when she heard him speak? Breathe Capybara's breath in her face, or time up in his own tail, or even pounce on him? The tiny, trembling leader of the game stood before the eager, eager players, his head well inside of his jacket, and squeaked. Wadney says, weed the sign, while the other rodents read, P.S. 142, elementary school for rodents, Camilla began pulling up weeds around the sign and wildly flinging them hither and yon until she was clear up to her teeth in dirt. The other rodents began to smile. Wadney says, whap your paws around your head. He peeked a little peek out of his jacket and saw, whap, whap, whappity, whap, whap. Camilla was whapping her paws around her head like crazy. 
One, he says, play wing around a woozy. Camila put on her, out her arms like wings and made an airplane noise. But where was the woozy? What was a woozy? By now, Wadney's voice was stronger and his head was entirely out of his jacket. Wake the leaves. Nobody move. Wadney says, wake the leaves. Camila, Capy, Capybara, grabbed one leaf. Wake up, she yelled. She snatched another. Come on, wake up, rise and shine, boo! And now all the other rodents were laughing. In a voice so strong he had to hold his own ears, Wadney called. Wadney says, go west. The rodents collapsed in a happy heap for rest. Camila Capybara, feeling very smart that she could tell directions by the sun, said, all right, I shall go west. And then she added, so there. West she stomped. Forever she was gone. And from that day on, the pupils of Wadney School never teased Wadney again. He was their hero. Hawaii for Wadney Wap, they called. Woo, woo, woody toot toot. The end. Well, Rodney was at a great disadvantage in front of Camila Capybara, for sure. But his weakness really became his strength because his weakness enabled him to defeat a giant rodent. And that's what our story is about today. Not about a rat with a speech impediment, but um, about David who defeated a giant in his time as well. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for using all we have to offer to glorify you. Amen. And now we have our psalm reading. Karen? Psalm 107, 1 through 3, and 23 through 32. Say thank you to the Lord for being so good, for always being so loving and kind. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others he has saved you from your enemies. He brought the exiles back from the farthest corners of the earth. 22. Let them tell him thank you for their sacrifice and sing about the glorious deeds. And then there are the sailors sailing the seven seas, plying the trade routes of the world. They too observe the power of God in action. He calls to the storm, the winds rage and waves rise high. The ships are tossed to the heavens and sink again to the depths. The sailors cringe in terror. They reel and stagger like drunkards and are at their wits end. Then they cry to the Lord in their trouble and he saves them. He calms the storm and stills the waves. What a blessing is that stillness, as it brings them safely into the harbor. All that those men would oh that those Lord men would praise the Lord for his loving kindness and for all of his wonderful deeds. Let them praise him publicly before the congregation and before the leaders of the nation. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Karen. As we come now to our time of prayer, I invite you to consider today the giants that you're facing in your life. We all have those things, don't we? Those things that look as if they're insurmountable. It, it might be health or finances, or it could be a work-related problem or an education issue. I don't know what your Goliaths are, but we all have them. And so I invite you to take a minute and consider the Goliaths that you're staring down in your life. And now I want you to picture yourself picking up five smooth stones. What's written on those stones? Maybe it's prayer. Maybe it's community. Maybe the word on your stone is 
more knowledge, more study. Or, or maybe it says um, music. Maybe it says wait. But with those five smooth stones in your pocket and the picture of your giants before you, let's go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we squeeze tight to the gifts that you have given us, the resources that we have available. We close them in our hands and hold them tight in our hearts. And yet we still tremble in the face of the giants in our lives. We fret over the future how we'll make it financially, physically, cognitively. We fret over the here and now, how we'll pay that bill, where our next meal will come from. We face so many giants in our lives, trembling even though you've already placed within the palms of our hands <clears throat> all that we need to be who you've called us to be. Remind us, O oh God, that you have not called us to fight our giants alone, but rather you have called us to stand alongside you, to walk in the righteousness that you have offered to us, and to face those giants that make our hearts tremble with our hearts centered in you. Oh God, we pray today for those who are not with us. We pray especially for Stan and Kim in their ministry in Cuba, in Havana. And we pray for all of those in the city of Havana fighting flooding right now. And all the others across that island who are dealing with weather-related traumas which create logistics issues like electricity outages, water interruptions, connection problems. Oh God, we pray for answers for our brothers and sisters in Cuba. They face so much. We pray also, oh God, for our church, and we give you thanks for the 20 years that we have remained steadfast, looking to you for guidance, looking to you for next steps. The history of our church is a Goliath few Davids could have faced, and yet, oh God, with the strengths that you have given to this community, we come through on the other side grateful, confident. Forgive us for our unbelief. Forgive us when we fret over the future of our church, when we know the history of our church is so strong with your presence. We get, come now before you, God, and, and, and offer this time of worship. We clear our minds and we're ready to be present, fully present in this moment. But then things start to draw our attention away, particularly the needs of those who are in crisis. And so, oh God, we lift up those names to you now, asking, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. the Frelick family, Fran Clark and family, Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer 
And now let us pray as Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I did forget to mention Eloise Templeton. You know our friend John Templeton. Um, his daughter has mono, and he said they were wanting to come today, but his daughter has mono, and they couldn't come. So be praying for Eloise. I told him we would mention her name. So. <coughs> second hymn can be found in our hymnal on page 48, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus.
Y'all keep this up and we're going to start calling you a band. <laughs> Our scripture reading today comes from 1 Samuel, and I said in connected passages, really the focus is the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel. And so if you have your Bibles, I do invite you to turn to 1 Samuel 17, and um, you can see why I'm not reading the entire passage because it is um, 58 long verses. And so we're going to do that a little bit differently. Instead, I'm going to read um, just a portion of that, beginning in verse 32. So that's 1 Samuel 17, 32. David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight the Philistine. Saul said to David, <laughs> you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight him for you are just a boy and he's been a warrior since his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And whenever a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and I struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, the Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now let's see, okay. I was gonna say, I know that I had my iPad up here today because I specifically was like, not gonna forget it today. I'm not gonna forget it. So, all right, I just put it down below. I'm also going to turn my fan on because that didn't happen yet. So I can do all these things. Hopefully, maybe, possibly. Can y'all chat among yourselves? Okay. All right. David and Goliath. If you haven't heard this story, you probably aren't from this country because it is such a famous story, such a common story, that even if you've never darkened the door of a church, you've heard of David and Goliath. You've heard of them in, as movies, themes, and underdog stories. You'll hear people say, well, that's a David and Goliath story. And what they mean is what? The underdog has won. The one who wasn't supposed to win, won. Well, let's see if this story really falls into that, that uh, outline that we've kind of superimposed upon it. When you tell a story, you want to tell people what the setting is, who the characters are, and what the plot is. At least, you, you may tell other aspects of the story, but your, your audience wants to know where did it happen, who did it happen to and what happened? Now, when I say story, I mean story like life story. I'm not, I'm just, this is a story that's in scripture. I'm not it's saying it is a fiction story. I'm saying it is a part of the narrative of scripture. <coughs> so as we look at this story of David and Goliath, as it happened, we begin with the setting. Where did it happen? What well, happened in Israel but it happened in the Shephelah Valley. Um, everybody say Shephelah. Shephelah Valley. It happened in the Shephelah Valley. And the Shephelah Valley, even to this day, is a very important place. It's fertile farm ground. And today, fruits are grown there. Fruits like olives and avocados and figs. And also vegetables and just vegetation in general. It's a rich farmland that is beneficial for <coughs> those living there and also um, anybody who can get to it. But the Shephelah is not just 
farmland. It's also, at least was in, in antiquity, a meeting place. <coughs> it was a meeting place where people would talk about trade. And they would come to that Shefela and they would discuss, like, how, what, what do you have to sell me? What do I have to sell you? And they would trade in that Shefela Valley. Because the Shefela is between the coast and the mountain region, which is, it's not really mountains today like we would call mountains because they're really, really old mountains. But in between there is this valley, the Shefela Valley. And so on one side of this valley, you have one army and another side, another army. And the Israelites and the Philistines weren't the only ones who battled there. They were just the ones who were prominent at that time, at the time of this, this event. So just outside the Shephela on either side to its, let me think, east, no, west, that way's west, to its west, it's the Philistine towns like Ashdod and Gath, and to its right are towns like Jerusalem. So does that give you the place where we're meeting? It sets up the setting for you. You know this is a land that people really want and that serves them really well. So who are our characters? Well, we have two groups, the Philistines and the Israelites. Now the Philistines in the biblical story are often considered the bad guys. Whenever the Philistines crop up, you know something bad's gonna happen. The Philistines come from the coastal plain and they are always wanting to move in towards Jerusalem, move through the Shephelah Valley and take over what Israelites consider the promised land. And so the Israelites consequently are doing what? Pushing them back. And so this tug, tug of war keeps going over centuries. And so we have these two groups, the Philistines and the Israelites. Now, the Philistines live along the coastal plain, and they have certain gifts because that's where they grew up. The Israelites are on the other side. They are raised in the mountains, and they have a certain set of skills along with where they live. There's another thing about the Israelites. They're not known for handling their adversaries with what we would call godliness. God says, you know, take over the land, and they don't just take over the land, they obliterate the populations. This is scriptural. All through scripture, the Israelites go, well, yeah, we're going to defeat them, but God, you're thinking like just barely defeat them. We want to annihilate them. That's just, that's just the way it is in scripture. Keep that in mind as we go through the story. The next character we have is Goliath. Goliath is a Philistine, and Goliath is between six foot nine and nine foot six. There are a lot of texts that reference this giant, Goliath, and they all have different heights. Why would that be? Because the way they measured things was different, and it depended on who measured them. A cubit was the length of from your elbow to your fingertips. Now, if I measure it, and Chris measures it, and Sage measures it, we're going to have some different measurements, right? So let's try to take the numbers out of it. And let's realize that Goliath was considerably taller than anybody else around. I looked up uh, tallest people. And it doesn't really serve to look at the tallest people in the world because for the most part, the people who got the tallest were very sick. They had a condition called giganticism and they didn't live very long, maybe in their 20s. So I said, well, okay, but what about a healthy person who's really tall? NBA. So I go and look and see who's the tallest players in the NBA. And one of them is Jorge Murasan. Do you guys remember him? He, I, I don't either. Uh, for those of you who don't, Chris, thank you. Glad you know who he is. Um, so he was seven foot seven. He's still alive, by the way. And he's seven foot seven. You know another player who was seven foot seven? Anybody? Manute Bowl. Manute Bowl um, was also seven foot seven. He passed away from kidney failure 
because once he came to the U.S., he took the U.S. culture a little too seriously and made a lot of big mistakes. And so Manute Bowl met an early end. But um, Jorge is still alive, seven foot seven, and they can operate just fine. They can run the basketball court, right? The reason I looked this up is because there's a very, there's a viral video of a, an author by the name of Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote a book, I think in, well, the early teens, um, called David and Goliath. And if you've read that book, or if you've seen the video, you would know that Malcolm Gladwell, he proposes that Goliath had a condition like um, Jorge did, but there were no treatments back then. He, he suggests that Goliath had this um, gigantism, giganticism, I don't know how to pronounce it, and that he was um, therefore clumsy and not really able to move well, and that he had a vision problem because there's a vision problem that goes along with this. And so I, I don't think that's right. It could be, there's no way to know. But the reason I don't think it's right is because he was a lifelong soldier. And if he's been a lifelong soldier and was stumbling around, height's not going to do it for him, right? He's going to, that's not going to work. He's not going to be a champion if he really has a hard time moving, if he's basically blind, which is what Malcolm Gladwell uh, suggests. So, I mean, we don't know. Again, let's take the numbers out of it and just see Goliath as a very large, almost, um, well, imposing figure who faces off with this boy, David, who we'll talk about in a minute. Goliath had four brothers who were as tall as he was, at least four. And he, when he would go into battle, wore armor that was known um, for its effectiveness among the Greeks. He wore the Greek armor. Um, again, they're coastal people, so they're along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, heavily influenced by the Greek people on the other side. And so he has a specially made armor for himself from the Greeks. And it's really good armor for standing still. It's not really good armor for moving. Um, you can move, but it's best if you're in hand-to-hand -hand combat because then you can do the damage without damage being done to you. It's not great for running, <laughs> for example, because it's heavy. It's like each piece is like an additional 15 pounds onto him, his already very large frame. So probably it was even more than 15 pounds a piece. So he's in this heavy armor. That's what he's used to now. And since he's used to it, he knows how to fight in this heavy armor. He's been a warrior since his youth. He also carries a sword, because if you're going to be in hand-to-hand -hand combat, a slingshot's not going to do you any good. You need something that is quick and in, you, that you have a lot of control over. Okay. Then we have David. Now, David is visibly younger than Goliath. Keep in mind that the story tells us that there were three of David's brothers in the war, just three. And he was one of seven or eight brothers, and only three of them were old enough to go into battle. He was the youngest, at least of the first seven. He was the youngest. And so he was a lot younger than, than Goliath, visibly so. He also is a shepherd, and he's skilled with a slingshot. Now, I've always thought of him, take, put a picture a slingshot. Do you have it? Are you picturing like a wooden thing with a rubber band that you pull back? Yeah, that's not it. So erase that vision. That's not it. Instead, what it was was a long um, rope or not really string, because it wasn't something that would break. It was more like leather, made of leather, braided probably to make it even stronger. And on the end of that string was a pouch. The pouch would have been leather of some kind of animal skin. And in order to use that slingshot, David would have probably twirled it in a figure eight 
And then once it was going really fast, he would have thrown his body into the spin before letting it loose. A, a bullet travels about as fast as a rock thrown, a stone thrown from a sling by an experienced slingshot user. It is a deadly weapon, even today. But you know what? We don't have to know what it was like today because David tells us. David says, I'm good. I listen, I've taken sheep out of the mouth of lions and bears. And if that doesn't work, I just take them down with my slingshot. Imagine David, day after day after day, being out in the field with a slingshot and practicing over and over again and finding out, well, huh, it doesn't work as well when I do this. It works better when I do this. It works best when I let it off here instead of here. You got that? He's practicing constantly. And so he's really good at the slingshot. He's like a marksman with the slingshot. Not so good with a sword, because he doesn't use a sword, but he's really good with a slingshot. Uh, let's see. So he would have placed just the right size stone in the slingshot. He knew by then that you didn't put one that was too heavy because it wouldn't sustain the distance. You had to put one in that was just the right size that would go the distance that you wanted to go. And David would have known because he practiced over and over again. All right, so what happens? These two armies are on opposing uh, hills and they're shouting insults at each other. And that's very common in the day. And it's some of the funniest stuff in the Bible. Um, if you, uh, read the whole thing, it's like, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> feed your flesh to the birds. Oh yeah, well I'm gonna feed yours to the dogs. I mean, it's that kind of back and forth that they do literally. So they're there and they're fighting. And finally, it's been going on for so long that they say, I tell you what, we'll send out one of our, our best fighter. You send out your best fighter, they'll fight and that'll decide it. And we won't have to have all this carnage. And that was common too. It made sense. It was cheaper. They didn't lose as many weapons, make as many dents in the armor. It was more effective. We have one death and not a thousand. So it's a very good strategy. We'll send two out. They'll um, fight it out. And then we'll know who, who will be the, the king or the ruler. This actually happened in one of my favorite movies, The Black Panther. Have y'all seen that movie? If you haven't seen that movie, it is an excellent movie. I highly recommend it. I, I'm still grieving over, um, yes, Chadwick Boseman's death. So it's hard to watch, but it's a great movie. And they have the same thing. They have a one-on-one -a -one -one fight to decide a dispute. The problem is, in our story, is Nobody will step up from the Israel's from Israel's line. And so it should have been the king. It should have been Saul. Saul should have taken one for the team. But do you remember last week? The spirit had left Saul. Do you remember that line? The spirit had left Saul. And so he just he just didn't have it. Saul, we already know, was a very um, erratic person. He got really mad, then he was not mad at all. It, he was very erratic. And this day he was, uh, these days apparently, he was overcome by fear and depression. And so he refused to go out and fight. Well, if the king's not gonna go out, the warriors are gonna be like, well, if he ain't going out, I, I ain't going, <laughs> I mean, I'm not going out there and risking my neck if he's not going out and risking his. So how does David get to the story? Well. David's father, Jesse, is worried about his sons. And he does what any daddy does. He says, let's fix them some food. Have you ever had your parents worried about you and say, listen, y'all, you may not have known they were worried about you, but they said, come on around for supper. Come on over and I'll fix you some supper. Because they were worried about you. They wanted to see how you were doing. They said, I'll fix them some food and I'll find out. So. Daddy Jesse makes a meal for his sons who are at the battlefield and says to David, come on out of the sheep, 
come away from the sheep, take this food up to the battlefield, feed your brothers, and then come back and tell me how they were doing. And so, you know, he takes his slingshot everywhere. So he wraps his slingshot around his belt. He gets the food and he goes up to the battlefield. And when he gets there, this, this shout off is going on. And David says, this is a great, I can't not tell you this uh, part. Uh, he gets out there and he goes, well, what's going on? Why, why isn't anybody going to go out and fight him? And his eldest brother, this is beginning verse 28, Eliab heard him talking to the men and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. He said, why have you come down? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? You're not doing what you're supposed to do. What do you do with the sheep? He says, I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down just to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? It was only a question. Have y'all ever said that? What have I done now? It was only a question. That's biblical. <laughs> Whenever you say that, that's you quote in scripture. And so David says, I can take him. And, and um, Saul says, uh, I don't know about that. And David goes, no, no, I can do it with God's help. And Saul goes, all right, but you need to put on my armor. And, and David says, okay. And he puts it on and it's too heavy. He can't do it. He says, I'm just going to go out on my own. And Saul's like, okay, <laughs> yuck, yuck, yuck. We're going to have to clean up some bones later because he is not going to survive this. And he stops. He goes out to kill Goliath, but he makes a stop in the riverbed and he picks up five smooth stones. Now, put a bookmark in the story right there. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about these stones for a minute. It's important that they are smooth. A smooth stone has less resistance than a rough stone. A rough stone is going to snag on the fabric or on the, on the leather. It's, not going to, it's going to have more resistance as it cuts through the air. A smooth stone is what he needs, one that doesn't have those jagged, jagged edges. Think about an arrow. When, you, when someone shoots an arrow, they don't just go pick up a stick. No, it's a smooth arrow. It has a smooth shaft shaped to move through the air quickly. So oh, think, think about a bullet. You don't have a jagged bullet. I mean, a shotgun, I guess it just goes everywhere. But a bullet is a smooth object that moves through the air quickly. A projectile without edges moves more smoothly through space. People have rough edges too. We have our rough edges and we move through life okay and then we hit a snag and one of our rough edges bumps against something and it slows us down. Our edges could be anything. We might have a rough edge of self-doubt or stress or loss or life changes or financial difficulties or family conflict. We might have a, um, a rough edge of addiction or anger or bitterness or self-absorption. Can you see that? Think about it for a minute. You've got rough edges, right? Now think about when your rough edges snag on somebody else's rough edges, when your self-doubt bumps against somebody else's arrogance, when Jesus said, love God, love people, Jesus meant even when they've got rough edges, even when your rough edges bump up against somebody else's. It's hard to go through life with rough edges. We, we need help to move through life. And so, David gets five smooth river stones, and he picks them up. And I, I can imagine him like sort of grabbing a handful and then like dropping a couple because they weren't quite right. And so I ask you again, what would your five stones be? You have those stones that help you in life. 
We all do. Remember that you have those on you at all times. And maybe some of those smooth stones would help rub off some of those other jagged edges of who you are. I don't know. All right, go back to your bookmark. Are you there? David hits Goliath with a smooth stone right in the noggin, and Goliath falls. Now, at this point, we don't know if he's dead or not. We just know it knocked him out. It knocked him down. And then David goes by, and what does he do? He takes Goliath's what? Sword. And what does he do? He relieves Goliath of his head. Now, that could have stopped right there. I mean, some would argue it could have stopped before that, but it definitely could have stopped then. But that's, let's let that be the end of our story. So now what we do is we look at what was the theme? What did we learn from that story? And some people would say, oh, it's the underdog. But I think we can see that it was basically, you know that scene in the movie, uh, the, uh, Harrison Ford is Indiana Jones. And he, he's in the desert and this swords person comes out and he's doing the swords like this and it's terrifying. <laughs> and, and Harrison Ford goes, and he reaches in his pocket, gets a gun, shoots the guy and walks away, right? It's a very funny scene if, you know, sorry, it is funny. So, <coughs> so that happens here too. David's like, that's a big sword, we done. David wasn't the underdog. He was a skilled adversary. They just weren't fighting the same battle. So is the theme then that, um, that if you have the right tool, you can win the battle? Not quite. Is the theme that um, if you use enough violence, the deed will be done? Well, I mean, if you know David's story, David's a mess. David does a lot of really dumb things over the course of his life and dangerous things. He's guilty of like a number of the things in the top 10. He, he makes a lot of mistakes. And in this story, what happens next is the Israelites chase the Philistines down and the text says, and leaves bodies bo behind them. Um, so they, they follow them, they chase them down, they obliterate the Philistines, and then they come back and they loot their camp and take away all the goods. So is that the theme? Get mean and get stuff? No. The theme of this story is that David has a heart for God, and in his best moments... In his best moments, he models for us what it means to have deep conviction and deep faith in God. And that's what puts him out there in this story, not his skill with a slingshot. It's his deep belief that he is called to do this by God. I'm not going to say whether or not he was called because unlike the Southern Baptist Church, I'm not going to say who can be called and who can't. But David felt called to do this deed. And so he went out and he did this. Now, please do not worship David. David's a mess. But he's also a man who at times has modeled deep and abiding faith in God. And because he had faith, God revealed to him his strengths and Goliath's weaknesses. Because David had faith, he was able to do what Many were not even willing to try. That kind of faith opens up the world of opportunities. The, the phrase, we, we don't have enough volunteers, becomes, because our numbers are small, we can really build strong relationships with the people we do have. What if we can't meet the budget? Becomes, 
Generosity is the greatest reward. Let's just give. No one's ever done that before. Becomes, what a wonderful opportunity to create something new in the name of God. David and Goliath, their story tells us this. You don't have to focus on obstacles and barriers in your life. You can turn your heart to God. You really can. And God will show you pathways you never knew existed. This story says, like my pastor Guy Sales said every time he baptized, baptized someone, that's what this story says. Beloved, you are a child of God and God takes great delight in you. And God has given you everything you need to overcome the obstacles in your life. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, the way that you love us slips from our memories. And so we fret and worry. Help us to slip our hands into the pockets of your love and feel those smooth round stones that you have given to us to overcome the enemies in our lives. We ask this in the sweet name of your son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Church, you have heard the word of God in all kinds of ways. You've sung the word of God. You've heard the God, word of God through Wadney Watt. And you have heard the scripture, and now you've heard the proclamation. Your call is now to respond in whatever way you feel led as we sing our final hymn. Our final hymn is not in our books, and it is a beautiful song, which uh, will invite you. You should be able to learn it pretty easy on the chorus side of the way. They can sing along with us at that point. So it's wherever he leads, I'll go. Some of you may know this old, old hymn. That was a song I had requested that they play. I didn't know if you were going to play it or not because we didn't have it in the hymnal, but I'm so glad you did. I love that song, and I thought it went perfectly with this uh, text, so thank you for going the extra bit and covering that for us. I love that song. 
And thank you, Sage. And thank you, Chris. You know, if David didn't know it, he couldn't have done it. It's because he knew it that he was able to face the giants. And we can too, because church, you are loved. And there is nothing you can do about it. Thanks for worshiping with Ecclesia. We'll see you next week.